Hello, you're watching Innovation Africa with GE. Our program explores innovative ways to address Africa's big social and economic issues. I'm Wale Famrewa, and thank you for tuning in. With widespread corruption, a relatively low adult literacy rate, weak government institutions, and inadequate fiscal infrastructure, Africa is widely seen as a tough and risky place to do business. So how do you win in a tough environment called Africa? In today's program, we speak to the people behind some companies that have succeeded in Africa despite many challenges and learn how they did it. Providing deep insights into the keys to building a successful business in Africa is Jay Ireland, the CEO GE Africa. He shares the approach to business at one of the largest and most successful companies in the last century. I also speak to Atedo Pitasai, chairman and founder of IBTC, a company now known as Stambic IBTC. We hear about what it took to grow a 1989 startup business to arguably Nigeria's top investment bank today. Jim Ovia, founder of Zenit Bank, also joins us to provide some insight into the lender's journey to the top of Nigeria's banking sector. And last but certainly not least, Devakuma Edwin, CEO Dangote Cement, reveals the approach to business that has transformed a former trading company in West Africa into Nigeria's largest listed company with subsidiaries in 15 African countries. But first, here's a summary of the story of GE Africa, an example of how one of the largest companies in the world is getting it done in Africa. big infrastructure company, maybe the biggest in the world. So the emerging markets have a tremendous uh, demand for more power, uh, more locomotives, more healthcare products. And so we're, we're naturally following that uh, progression globally. Sub-Saharan Africa is very important in that context. There's a tremendous uh, infrastructure deficit. Uh, we have a great solution set for countries like Angola, uh, Nigeria, South Africa. So this is a place where we put a big focus. The things we do our solution set for the countries here. We do the things that are important for the region. We're not just a company here to make money, we're a company here to do good. We have to provide not just the product and the technical capability, we have to provide a great solution. Not only should GE be prospering, but our region and our people should be prospering from the growth of GE's brain. Every day we are building on the relationship so that we achieve the goals for this nation. GE believed in us. My hopes for Africa is in delivering for the African people a high quality of life that is affordable and also easily accessible. GE has been in Africa since 1898. It was actually one of its first overseas offices was opened in Johannesburg. So we've been there for well over 100 years and uh, we're really now making a concerted effort and really driving change from within the company as well as uh, externally. So we're looking forward to really being a, a player in Africa. Growth, stability and prosperity. Africa has a long way to go to grow. Uh, there's a lot of potential. From a stability standpoint, uh, stability is what our people need, as well as uh, a company to really thrive, and then prosperity for all. You take any country in Africa and you look at the amount of discoveries of natural resources and natural wealth, this is probably one of the wealthiest continents in the world. The human capital resources of Africa is also improving. And so you've got a number of factors that are lining up to support the rapid industrialization and the rapid development of Africa. As a multinational company coming into the continent, you have to understand what the culture is, those influences of the culture, and how do you develop a strategy that doesn't negate who a person is in their culture, but also develop you know, a, you know, a GE Africa culture that's sustainable. This is a great time to be there and watch how the continent takes off. I've had the chairman, Jeff Immelt, visit. We've made commitments to governments. We've signed letters of intent, memorandums of understanding. 
when our customers in Africa look at that, they see a company that's coming in as a committed company over the long term. The everyday African needs power, they need transportation, they need goods, they need health care. A lot of people don't know just how big GE is. We are involved in aviation with jet engines, we're involved in transportation with locomotives, we do power generation, we have health care products. We can help develop the continent from the standpoint of improving all those areas, hospitals, uh, power generation, etc. The products that we make and the products that we sell, uh, all of them are what Africa needs. We serve about a thousand active customers and we have something like 25,000 radiology uh, diagnostic imaging equipment spread out throughout the continent. So that means a lot of customers to cater for. We need quite a big workforce to cover that. Uh, we've got about 300 plus people throughout the continent in different functions and we've been driving particularly over the last two or three years a very strong localization effort. We do believe as GE that uh, the way we are going to take a continent like Africa to the next level ensuring what our customers both governments and private institutions expect from us uh, we need to localize. So we believe in knowledge transfer, we believe in training, we believe in education, and we're developing infrastructure for this. And we are now training and educating radiologists in this country. So we do believe we work for the future of the continent. In the past, I had walked up in various conferences to other companies and asked for things as little as 16 slice CAT scan and some executive of others said, oh no, you're coming from Africa, you can't maintain it, you can't run it, you can't, you can't use it. I felt so insulted, actually, and I felt I needed to do everything to show the world that Nigeria was ready, and Nigeria had the capable people. Thank God, GE has been able to help me prove it to the world. We have an opportunity to have an impact on global health and increasing access to healthcare, particularly here in Africa. GE is coming to the forefront with technologies that are easy to use, low in cost, and most effective. We want to offer uh, the same sort of key capabilities as an example in our diagnostic equipment but do it at a lower price point that's more affordable for some of these rural clinics. We see that as a, a real tremendous opportunity in terms of being able to uh, raise the healthcare levels across the continent. One of the key things for us is gonna be developing talent. And we have to develop talent locally, as I'm talking university graduates coming into our leadership programs and then basically understanding how to operate within GE. I believe that Africa needs to be led by Africans. We understand our issues and our problems the best. Growth doesn't happen without leadership. Having Africans taking leadership positions in GE is critical for GE's growth. We do have a lot of talented people in Africa. Our goal is to find them and make sure that they're equipped to do the job that we need. We have programs that are uniquely designed to develop local talent to succeed those that are currently held by expatriates. For our entry-level talent, we have our Early Career Development Program. The Early Career Development Program is unique uh, for the region. It allows people who are coming straight out of university to have exposure to a large multinational like GE. So giving them a year to spend time with senior leaders, with special projects, and understanding what the corporate culture is all about really set, sets them up for some good success long term. Stefania is one of our financial management program participants right now. She's from Angola, uh, has really started off very well. She's going to spend two years rotating between four different assignments, some in the region and some outside, and is really doing a great job. The program has the right structure that allows me to, to build my leadership and also my finance skills. 
is a great experience. We, we have opportunity to grow, to develop a lot of skills, and I'm really enjoying it. I think it's a great program for Africa. I think it's a great program for an individual, and I think uh, uh, it's a good program for anybody else who's aspiring to get further ahead in GE. For me, it's been really stretching. I have grown a lot, developing my leadership skills. I believe it's really a great program to develop leaders in Africa. That is one of the skills we are lacking in our region. It's a long-term investment. I mean, you're dealing with young 20-year-olds, and we hope to see them move into leadership positions, my job, etc., over a long period of time. So we've done a lot, a lot of work around that. It's a two-pronged approach. We're going to have to do a lot of buying of talent, and what that means is trying to, you know, attract as many qualified candidates that we can that can come in and make an immediate impact. I knew that there were a lot of African nationals within the diaspora that had left home to become educated, to also to, to go work. Given kind of the markets in the U.S., the markets there were sat being saturated and the job opportunities were drying up. So we developed a, a huge initiative called Back to Africa where we're going out there specifically to try to find, you know, talent. Can we not get them to come back home and leverage what they've learned abroad, be a part of GE, and not only come be a part of GE, but we're going to help you do that and we're going to help provide that. And it's been very successful. I'm actually returning to Kenya. Uh, I grew up in Nairobi and went to school here and then finally left, uh, went to the U.S. for my undergraduate and graduate education. Uh, worked with GE for uh, almost for the last 19 years. And uh, finally this great opportunity opened up and I decided to come back and uh, help grow Africa as well as GE. And so it's kind of coming back home. What we will eventually get is we'll have local people in all of the leadership positions. There are a lot of laws, um, there are a lot of you know, a cultural influences that are designed and that have been developed to oppress the development of women. And women are second class. Um, while there are leaders, there are leaders that are in a compartmental space. There are leaders in their homes and they're expected to, you know, be a wife, a mother, and take care of the home first and work second. Within GE, we value all employees, irrespective of their gender, um, their ethnicity, nationality, things like that. And we wanted to bring that to pass in GE Africa as well. And so we have a GE Africa Women's Network where we get women together and help to address some of the personal issues that they're having. And, and we look at, as a company, how can we help to lessen some of those things, be it you know, getting to and from work, um, having a support system when they're dealing with issues and things like that, because all that impacts their ability to perform in the office. We have five hubs throughout GE Africa, and we get together to talk about what are their developmental challenges and what can we as a company do to help eliminate those things or help lessen those things so that they can be more productive at work while not sacrificing their duties at home. And it's been very impactful. And what I'm trying to do is really be a role model because I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I have two children, and I'm a, a female executive in a multinational company trying to really have it all. And it's hard and you have to make sacrifices. And so what I try to do is role model, you know, the behavior of what's expected and also be transparent in terms of the sacrifices that I have to make and in hopes of being able to inspire other women. GE Women's Network is a voluntary organization to grow retain and attract successful women in GE. And the focus is on both personal and business growth through the GE network. While it focuses on the women's personal career development, it also focuses on them being successful in GE for GE to be successful as a business. The ability to impact the African people with increased capability in logistics is absolutely critical. That happens through more locomotives, more cars that can haul stuff. In the airline business, you've got to make sure that you can really get it from point A to point B at the right place, on time, etc. So service, reliability, capability of engines of what we sell are, are absolutely prime importance. I think a good example of what we're capable of doing is what we're doing here in South Africa. We're bringing our best locomotive technology to South Africa to help them improve their operational efficiencies, both in terms of reliability and a significant reduction in the cost of operating the railroad through our locomotive technology. We have a partner here in South Africa 
and we're actually now localized and building uh, those locomotives here in South Africa. So far, we've built about 110. We also have uh, signaling uh, technology. We have some very interesting software solutions that actually optimize the operation of the train and can significantly reduce the fuel consumption of the train and also increase the length of the train that it can operate uh, so that it increases the, the throughput, the freight throughput on the rail system. We just signed um, a uh, alliance agreement with our partner Transnet Engineering that allows us to produce not only for South Africa, but for export as well. In fact, we've got our first contract uh, in Mozambique for 10 locomotives that will be built here uh, and shipped to uh, Mozambique. And we're also working on several projects, uh, such as a project in Angola to do the same thing for up to 100 locomotives. Angola uh, is looking to develop itself as kind of a regional uh, rail transportation hub, and then Mozambique, both on the, the uh, national operator, but also there's uh, uh, a number of large mining companies that are looking to develop uh, Mozambique's natural resources where they'll need a significant amount of rail infrastructure to develop those resources. G-E-S-A-T, which stands for South Africa Technologies, a joint venture that was established. GSAT is a joint venture that is GE owning 74.9% and Mine Workers Investment Company owns 25.1% of the joint venture. The synergies between the two are very clear. The Mine Workers Investment Company, by virtue of the position, they're the investment company of the mine workers and they're separate PTY Limited, which means that their role is to look at investments that will bring returns that look after the welfare of the mine workers' children, as well as the mine workers after they leave the employment of the mine. My role, I think, as the CEO is to strategically look at the roles that have to be performed to ensure sustainable business for GSAT, and to also look at the operational requirements. That means we satisfy the customer today to enable us to be able to be more successful tomorrow. The power generation challenge in Nigeria as well as in the rest of the continent is that there's just too little supply and there's tremendous demand for incremental power. GE working directly with the federal government, working with project sponsors to create additional incremental generation capacity of about 10,000 megawatts. That is a significant commitment. They're looking for 10 gigawatts of power in the next 10 years. And we can help them with that because we do that. We refurbish equipment. We know how to do that. We've been in the business for over 100 years. We have new products that can work. We do wind projects, gas turbine projects. So there's a lot of different ways that we can impact their needs to develop these 10 gigawatts of power in the next 10 years in Nigeria. There's a lot of excitement about this. We're making tremendous progress, and this is an area that we demonstrate again our commitment to Nigeria as well as our commitment to the broader region. In Durban, South Africa, we have the waste to energy product using our Yenbach or gas engines, taking the methane generated by the landfill or the waste and then pumping that into our engines, which then provides power and then lights homes and have provided a number of jobs as well. We're looking at replicating that across the continent. It's been a very good project for us. As part of our energy business, we have a water business as well. And uh, as you look across the continent, there's some tremendous water challenges here, both in terms of just providing basic water services to the public, but also on the industrial side. As an example, uh, one of the big challenges right now in the mining sector is acid uh, mine discharge. And that is something that we uh, have some specific technologies and solutions for that we can help address the industrial sector on water too. One of the big parts of our technology strategy is making sure that we are not only bringing technology that is of the highest value from an operational and efficiency standpoint, but also from an environmentally uh, friendly standpoint as well. So I think water is a very important part of our portfolio from that standpoint. As we help countries build out their infrastructure, we do that in an environmentally and friendly way. That's a peek into the story of GE Africa. Let's now hear from our panel, starting with GE Africa's Jay Ireland, who comments on the possibilities open to winning businesses in Africa. Yeah, well, thanks. Good to be here. Um, 
When, we, when you look at Africa, everyone will talk to you about the demographics, the number of people, the number of people going to middle class. Uh, it's so many of the fastest growing economies, et cetera. But really what has to happen going forward is a real focus on improving the infrastructure, um, capabilities in the countries, as well as skills building. Those are the two big things that are going to continue the demographic rise that you see. And if we don't address those problems, I think we're going to start to see more challenges. There's challenges to operate anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, in, and we're in, we're over 20, 20 plus African countries. Uh, where we've been, uh, we, we do roughly about two and a half billion dollars of revenue a year here, growing at about a 30% rate. And so for us, you know, we've got, and we're across a number of different industries. We got healthcare, oil and gas equipment, uh, our locomotive business, uh, our power generation business and our aviation business with aircraft engines. So, so we're pretty much an infrastructure company and we see the ability to really change the dynamics of African growth by improving on the in infrastructure. There needs to be more logistics, there needs to be more power, and there needs to be more healthcare, all of that. We'll get into GE's history and of course it has that track record of winning wherever it goes. But Jim, I want to hear from you. In the, in the early 90s, you founded Zenit Bank, and today Zenit Bank is, by many metrics, one of the largest, if not the largest bank in Africa. I want to hear about the courage it takes to make that step, because clearly there were so many players in this market before you decided to take the plunge into banking as an entrepreneur. To build a winning business in Nigeria specifically, and anywhere in Africa or even the world at large, you need to have a winning strategy. When you have the right winning strategy, then you can build a winning business. And to have the right strategy does mean that you need to look at the space you intend to operate, which market in terms of which industry you're going to operate. In this case, you're talking about banking and financial services. Then you look, you need to look at which products and services you tend to offer. You possibly cannot really offer everything. Then you need to have a proper structure. Corporate governance is key. And uh, you also need to respect the rules, or if you will, um, the, 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 the laws are set up those businesses. For businesses that are regulated like banking, you cannot, you cannot violate. Right. You cannot, you need to be very professional. Yeah, Jim, sorry to jump in, but I, we will get to as many of these points that you just uh, mentioned. But I really want to hear about you know, what it takes from inside. As an entrepreneur coming into a market like Nigeria with all these challenges, you came into a market where there were, there were established names that have been in Nigeria for pretty much a century. And yet you took the plunge to start a new institution in a very competitive market. Tell us about the courage it takes to make that move. First and foremost, you need to have, still have the right strategy. Without the right strategy, you cannot be successful. So I could repeat this over and over again. Having the right strategy, aside from the fact that you already made the decision you wish to set up a bank. And what other strategic issues are we talking about? One, you need to have skilled workforce. You need to have well-qualified people. And when you have the right people that will run the businesses, definitely, inevitably, you'll be successful. You, that's the golden rule. You must have very well-qualified people, skillful people that will run the businesses. Then you also need to set up the structure, the proper structure too, you know that will enable you to succeed in terms of you know, uh, taking on the competition in the marketplace. Right. We'll come to many of those themes later on, but um, I tell you, I want to hear from you as well about that issue of courage. If you can take us back to the 1990s, early 90s, when you decided to make that move, today, Stambik IBDC is the largest investment bank in Nigeria. Yeah, I think in terms of making that move, you know, there's a difference between the local investors and the foreign investors. The foreign investors looked at the whole world as their stage and decide where they want to go. Some of us decided we're Nigerians, we want to play in this marketplace, so we waited for an opportunity and we knew the general direction of what we wanted to do. I knew I wanted to form a bank, an investment bank, so I was waiting for the right time to make that move and as soon as I was qualified to make that move, I made the move. Yeah. When I said qualified, there was a rule that you needed 10 years experience as a CEO, so I couldn't make the move you know, earlier than that. So it's well, you saw like, a gap, obviously, that needed to be filled. It wasn't that there were no investment banks around, but in all honesty, I know it sounds immodest. It was that one had the confidence that the investment banks we had at the time were not very good. 
Mm. I was in the business already working in an investment bank, and I felt that I could start a bank and take these guys on and beat them. Right. Now, that, that doesn't always apply in every industry. Today, we have some industries in Africa where the, the players, the competitors are very good. But I'm saying that it's a bit easier if you identify a sector where you, you, where you believe and you can see that the, the top players are not very good. So it gives you the confidence that you can take them on. I want to hear from you, Dave Akuma. I mean, Dagote Cement is a well-known name across Africa today. It's in 15 countries. Uh, talk to us about building a world-class company and how you define that in the context of Africa. Well, when we talk about world-class companies, it could be in different areas. One is the, the scale of the business. Another could be in technology. Another could be in innovation. Other areas could be in uh, uh, areas like pollution control and, and environmental friendliness. So if you take world scale, see, we started our flour milling, for example, with 500 tons per day capacity. We ended up with 7,000 tons per day, being the single largest flour milling business in the world. And you take our cement business. We started in 2000 importing cement with the terminal. Today we are in 15 different countries. We are number one in Africa. And we are number two in the world in terms of market capitalization. And we are in the top five in terms of profitability. And it's the same. We ended up being number one in pasta in Africa, number two in noodles in Africa. So uh, the one is when you look at the global uh, scale, which is one is in terms of investment and production, in, in, uh, uh, investing in manufacturing capacity, which we have done that. Another is in areas of technology. If you take, for example, our cement plants, I can openly challenge that there is no cement plant in the world, whether it is US or Europe, right. has a better technology than us, not the whole plant, not even in one department. So we have gone for the best of the technology. So. We have gone world scale in terms of investment in technology, including robotics. Right. And in terms of environmental friendliness, we have never agreed to follow the norms of the country where we are working with. We always look at the best standards, global standards in the world, right. whether it's in terms of pollution, uh, uh, dust emission, noise emission, NOx level, SOx level. We are always on par. With, we peg ourselves with the global standards. Right. Okay, so let's talk a bit about that. Thinking global, thinking world class, thinking big. And I tell you, I want to hear your thoughts about that. I mean, the business you've set up, we know now it's within Standard Bank, which is a Pan African Bank. But um, let's talk about the. Is, is, do you think that is something missing in the way Nigerians, in particular as entrepreneurs, think about the opportunity in Africa, thinking world class? I don't think so. I, I think the rules are the same. If, if you want to, to think about going world class, and, and let me just explain, even when we started IBTC at that young age, my intention was to get, have, make it the best investment bank in Nigeria and eventually in Africa. You've got to think big sometimes. Mm. It didn't matter if people thought you were dreaming, right. but you knew that you were trying to set up a, a solid institution. And that was important because you don't cut corners. Also, you take some decisions and actions and they're with you forever. Mm -hmm. One, surround yourself with the best people you can find. Right. I didn't need to go to anybody to tell me to always hire the best people. Right. Some, some of those people are still in the bank today. Right. Because they were the very best I could find in this country, you know. And it wasn't even as if one felt naturally that even if you expanded it globally, you would get people who were better able to add value in Nigeria in an investment bank any better than those 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 that we found. So you got to sort of and so that it was a merit-driven organization from the start. And there was conviction. In any case, if you have big dreams you want, and you want to become the very best. How on earth do you think you can beat those who are up there? You're the newcomer on the first day, your market share is zero. Right. How are you going to beat them and become the best in Nigeria or in Africa if you're surrounding yourself with uh, mediocres? Right. So the point I'm making is that the, the two went together. But Jim, I want to hear from you as well. Um, Nigeria obviously offers so many challenges. It's a, it's a phenomenon in Africa. We have infrastructure, we have sk skills gaps. And of course, even for technology, I know things have improved, but especially when you started, technology was, was more or less not uh, 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 something that you talked about in the context of banking. Well, you obviously um, decided to focus on that in, in your strategy for Zenit Bank. Talk to us about that innovative thinking, that thinking out of the box that made you decide to go that way. First and foremost, any successful enterprise anywhere in the world must have some unique identity. There must be some unique features in their product and service that they offer that's completely different. If not completely different, that's similar, but at the same time, they deliver them differently. That's what we did several years ago when we set up the bank. 
we thought we could be a little bit different in terms of the point technology. At that point in time, there were even no internet services right. in the whole country. And that's true. We were some of the first to embrace, embrace internet services in terms of you know, uh, letting the public, the customers know there are better ways of doing things, different from the usual brick and mortar. Yep. They could do things online. And um, of course, the infrastructure for internet services was, at best, very minimal. It made a big difference. In fact, it gave us a quantum leap, if you will. And many customers were beginning to recognize the fact that this is an innovation who you are not used to, if only for the fun of it, for the excitement of it, if we could start deploying such resources. Every teller, every bank staff and officer had a computer on their table to work with, which really was uncommon at that point in time. And the bigger, the older banks, even in the UK, they were still manual. They have manual ledger. And that's true. A bank like uh, some, some banks, some of the older banks, even in the UK, for their savings account processing, they were done manually at a point in time when our were fully computerized. Right. So that gave us a tremendous edge to yeah. leapfrog over and above the older banks. They were still embracing brick and mortar way of deploying products and services. Channel of distribution were also very important. Yeah. We're able to deploy the electronic ways of channels of distribution as opposed to you physically going to do businesses right. uh, in real in real life right. in your time. Yes. Well, Jay, I want to hear from you. I mean, GE is it's one of the largest companies in the world. It has a track record of, of performance, especially in the 80s and 90s. We saw that mm -hmm. really strong dynamic growth. And I want to hear from you about setting those targets. Uh, I hear from the culture in GE, it's all about trying to be number one or number two. <laughs> Um, well, that was a mantra, uh, definitely. I mean, and it was a, a thought process at the time to get everybody focused around a, a goal. And, and also to get, you know, one of the, GE's been around for 130 years. And the reason is, is because we, every decade, you've got a different looking GE from the prior decade. And so if you, you know, obviously we started in power generation and lighting, et cetera, but we, we have an oil and gas business today, oil and gas equipment that is $15 billion of revenue. Didn't exist in, in the late 90s. Came through acquisitions, but to fund that, we sold our plastics business, we sold NBC, which is a broadcasting business, we sold a number of different GE Capital businesses, insurance, et cetera, that we were in. And Jeff has remade the portfolio, similar to what Jack did in the 80s. And so as we remake the portfolio, that's what contributes to the success. There's only, there's only, I think we're the only company left in the original Dow. Yes. And so that's the reason. And it's, it's this continual looking at what you're doing and making sure that you're making a difference. Right. And yes, we have targets. We've got, you know, it's a performance oriented meritocracy. You know, everybody is there. They all, pretty much all of us started training programs and, I've been with GE for 34 years, and so it's it's just that continued look and continually questioning of where we are, where where we are, where we were. We've been in Africa from 1898. Right. Now, we didn't take advantage of that as much as we should have. So the last three years, we've done that, and I think that's really the dynamic that has it. Is you just continually question where you're at, what's the strategic value, as Jim said, the strategy, and how you're going to succeed. And then you know continue to focus on performance. Um, Dev Kuma, I want to hear from you. Uh, just before we take an ad break, if I may, it's a bit brief. Uh, he's made some very interesting points about you know building that culture. And of course, I think one thing I took away from what you said is at some point you decided to sell some of your businesses and taking those tough decisions, those real decisions. I want to hear from the Dangote story about that. Well, regarding restructuring of business, you know, uh, uh, we enter into a business and we soon find that probably your business metrics should change. The same thing happened with us. In fact, if you see our businesses, we started with textiles. Right. And it became so competitive with the imported textiles coming into the country, we had to sell those businesses off. Mm -hmm. And uh, a year back, we again sat together. We saw that, okay, our cement business is growing. It's flourishing very well. And it's our biggest business today. But we do not know where we are going to end up with the cement business. Probably the things could change in the uh, uh, coming years. So we decided that, okay, we would again get out of the businesses where the entry threshold is quite low. And that is how we got out of the flour, flour pasta and the noodles business. Yeah. And we decided that we'll look for the future. So we decided to invest in petroleum refinery, petrochemicals, fertilizer. So this is where we have started. So 
we have to always be thinking about the future because where we are today, the, the competition, the market, the situation could totally change. So we have to have our footprint and other businesses which could be the future. We head now into a short break and when we return, we continue our discussion. Welcome back to Innovation Africa with GE. As we continue our look at building winning businesses in Africa, I take you back to a panel that tells the story about how it can be done. Let's hear from Atedo Peterside, founder and chairman of Stambik IBTC, about raising the bar in search of top talent. Yes, I mean, every day I go out and I meet people and they say, you know, you don't know me, sir, but I applied to work in IBTC and I was not hired than I had was a program. <laughs> I'll give one explaining that it was an investment bank. We only had so many people. Mm -hmm. So we were 29 people who were very good. We were, we were, sometimes we were having to pick the best amongst the poor. It was as simple as that. But I think beyond just picking, him, picking the best people, there are some things that were also very vital that must go together. One, as an institution, always doing your homework. Right. You know, because we did the homework 24-7. To research it. In terms of every, knowing everything you have to know to enhance your business. The other thing also that we did is that was building relationships. When I say building relationships, I can even use the example of Jim here beside me. If you go and check the records, then it Bank began I think a few months after IBTC. Right. By the time he was doing his IPO, I think he knew and I knew that IBTC was going to be the issue house for his IPO. Right. Not because you had good people alone, but you also built relationships. You identified potential customers and you knew that people like Jim, it was a matter of time, one day was going to go public. Right. So even before that day came, you were already discussing and thinking and, you know, in that direction and so on. Of course, if, if you had a lousy product and you had the wrong price, it wouldn't use you. But the point is that you have to build the relationship because it's a service sector activity. So if you didn't build relationships, you didn't do your homework, right. you know, and you, you will still fall with the best people. So you've got to hire the best people and right. put them through the right habits and the, and the right management discipline. Jay, I want to hear from you about some points you made about building relationships, mm -hmm. getting the best team. I know GE has that culture of trying to bring the best people on board and, of course, developing them as they go along. Well, I mean, we've done that a long time, but I mean, the, the thing about relationships is absolutely critical. And I think that's how you look at how we've been in Africa, is that right. you know a lot of companies still try to serve Africa with their headquarters in Europe or Dubai or somewhere. And you know, it's, I think you have to be on the ground. And you have to be on the ground, you know, I live in Kenya, but um, you have to be on the ground and understand what people are going through. Not just consumers, but also business people, how, what the challenges are, et cetera. And I think, I think that's, that's a helpful aspect, and more importantly, I can get to anywhere I need to get very quickly if there's right. an issue. And we've, you know, I think, and then tied into that is to your point, building out great local people. Yeah. You know, not bringing in a bunch of expat. We're probably 95, 97 percent local uh, right. Africans in our right. in our businesses. So that's obviously a key as well. Okay, let's talk about um, some of the frameworks the Fukuma that um, Dangote Cement has put together in terms of how it is moved across the continent. I mean, now, like I mentioned earlier, you're in 15 countries. I think it takes some level of organizing to, to, to be able to expand at that rate. Can you just talk to us about how that business is organized to be able to leap into other markets like you have done? So primarily, when we grew very fast within Nigeria, we set up the framework how things would operate in, in, in all areas. What, as I said, you know, one is the, the manufacturing part of it, the, the investment strategy, then the, uh, the training and development of the staff, corporate governance, accounting principles, policies and procedures. So we set up a complete framework. And uh, as you're aware, we were planning to go to uh, uh, and list a company in the London Stock Exchange. So we built up the complete framework of the, how the company should operate. Yeah. So when we uh, decided to go into other countries, it was quite easy to replicate the models, apart from the local challenges. Because the local, the, 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 yeah, in every country has its own challenges, has its own different issues, which we had to manage. Which is why, as an entrepreneur-driven company, we have been successful because, you know, initially you took the issue of the challenges in the African market. Um, there is no gain without pain. Mm -hmm. So if everybody wants to say that there should be no challenges, there should be good facilities, then 
uh, really, why are we even looking at the emerging markets? People, the businessmen, looking at the emerging markets because you have much better returns because of the risk. It's always the risk versus the returns. So we should be successful in managing the risks, and then you have better returns. So country-wise, when we go in, we do a risk evaluation, right. and we do a proper detailed planning. And that helps us to succeed as we enter into a new country. Yet, right. in spite of all this, you should have deep pockets because the risk, in spite of your best risk assessment and planning. Let's talk about, let's talk about building something to last. And Zenith obviously has, has emerged. And I want to hear from you, especially about succession planning, how you make it an institution. It's not just about one person. I mean, you've left Zenith Bank for a couple of years in terms of your, your, your role in management. So talk to us about making sure that when you leave, it can continue, the vision continues, selling that vision to the team. We had the right people over a number of years, and I could recall when I retired, uh, about a few years ago, actually to be specific, it was in 2010, and July 2010, there was this issue of, oh, could we really possibly find someone within Zenit that would be able to replicate the success story of what we've done? The answer was emphatic, yes. We're able to find someone who not only could replicate the success story of Zenit, was able to uh, perform, in fact, outperform my own results, uh, was able to generate a profit, profitable track record that was much better than what I was able to achieve. The profit, the CEO that took over from me, generated was superior to mine. Mm -hmm. And of course, at that point in time, we also had the opportunity that we needed to empower someone else that would also take over from the current CEO at that point in time, of course, someone in the uh, position of Gordon Mephila, yeah. who also himself had to also get empowered, have got the opportunity to become the next central bank governor. And in the next two dozen years, we also would have trained CEOs, potential CEOs, that would also be able to run uh, uh, the, the opportunities that we have there. Mm -hmm. That is the reason. I think I want to bring you in to talk about what is a common problem in Africa? Corruption. And, you know, a lot of companies, especially foreign companies, shy away from Africa because they believe there will be a stigma going into Africa. There's no way you can do um, business with integrity. I want to hear from your story about how you've been able to manage that sensitive issue on this continent. My, my, my comment on that corruption might surprise you a little because from the onset, I mean, my mind was made up and the immediate management team around me were very, very clear. We were not interested in trying to cut corners. We were not interested in getting involved in, in the kickbacks and bribes and so on. Not because we were not aware that some other banks might have been doing them and so on. But we were trying to build an institution. We wanted to build something that would last. You know, if you think very carefully, if you only want a piece of business because you gave somebody a bribe, then really you've not built a business. Because as soon as somebody has come to offer him a higher, a, a, a higher amount of right, you've lost the you've business. Lost that so you had to, it was like building a brand name. But does it come at a cost? Um, of course it comes at a cost in the sense that some will argue, well, it depends on, let's be careful. Perhaps in the long term, very long term, there's no cost. In the short term, then, there could be some cost because we lost business many times because right. we refused to play ball. Right. So there are many things you could have gotten you didn't get. Right. But but my my point my 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 thinking always was that those things were never ours. A piece of business that you could only get by paying a bribe was never a business anyway. Right. It was a business for whoever was the highest bidder right. in the marketplace. So it was never yours. Right. The one that was yours is the one that the customer is convinced that is your institution. He wants to put his faith in. He likes the work you've been doing. He likes your track record, and therefore he's bringing his business over to you and increasing your market share genuinely. And you will keep and retain that customer unless you disappoint him or somebody else gets 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 better at doing the same thing, at better pricing and so on. So of course you have to remain, you know, a, a lean operation competitive. Yeah. And also apart from earlier when so I is that part about, of the strategy, be lean, because it may take a while for, for you to succeed. For us it was, but don't forget I'm talking about a specific type of business investment banking. Right. If some of the banks that we met, you know, from the onset. The biggest disadvantage they had was that they were overstaffed. Mm. So they could not compete with us on price. Mm. So we, we could undercut them. We could offer the same services better, 
at a lower price. Right. And if you ever allow your, your, your sort of opponent to catch you in a position where he has a better product at, at a lower price, you're in trouble. Right. Jay, I mean, uh, Jay has been around for over a century, like you mentioned. It's listed on New York Stock Exchange, it should um, uh, adopt the highest corporate governance mm -hmm. standards. So talk to us about some of the points he has made. He made you made some great points. Um, I like the point of, you know, if it, that you won the business without earning the business. You know, that you're not going to earn it long term. And there have been times for us across the continent that we've had, you know, we've had to walk away from business. But, you know, it's not an Africa alone issue, number one. And number two is it's two sides. You have to compete on technology and cost. And you got to have the best cost and technology in whatever business it is. Yeah. And, you know, it's not necessarily lean. It's an aspect of what value you're bringing to your customer. So for us, we've got a great customer in the Dangote group, you know, and they're very tough negotiators, as, <laughs> as we know. And, um, but you know, and our job is to give them the best value for the equipment that we're selling, cost yeah. as well as technology. And I think you heard, you know, the top technology they've done, um, all that stuff has been absolute critical. So we have to do, in Africa, there is no difference in what we sell in Africa than we sell anywhere else. And there's no difference in our employees from the standpoint of how we train them, what kind of processes they do. So if you go to a GE office in, in Wichita, Kansas, and you go to one in Lagos, Nigeria, you're going to see different types of people, but you're going to see the same focus around, around that. So right. and that's the key thing. Jim, he mentioned technology as a strategy, and it's part of your mantra at Zenit Bank. Can you just speak to the, the, the cost and the benefit of deploying that as a winning strategy for your business? Technology is actually very expensive to deploy. And when you de do deploy technology, the benefits come much later. And it gives you the flexibility to be able to offer various channels of distribution through technology. Without technology, you could not possibly offer such certain services at all. So if you are competing, if you choose to compete with an institution that's technologically enabled, definitely you'll be beaten from the one before you take off from the track. You are just completely beaten flat-footed. Technology is an enabler. Technology allows you to deploy so many uh, uh, products and services that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to deploy. And the customer will be amazed the extent to which you are able to offer tremendous services in a very efficient way, in a very proficient way through technology. And you will be a winner any day, any time. If you are ready to spend the cost, the resources, and also the training, not just acquiring technology that matters in terms of computers and software. You need to have skillful people who are also very knowledgeable, who are also technologically savvy to be able to deploy those services for you. I want to hear from you, David Kuma. I think Dangote Cement has a very interesting story in terms of how it has beat the competition. Because I'm, I, I recall that you only started manufacturing cement less than a decade ago in Nigeria, but now you are the top manufacturer. In fact, many people suggest that you have actually um, encouraged or inspired even the foreign guys who were here for well over two decades to make a move and bet on Nigeria. Speak to that point about defining your, your goals and strategy beyond <laughs> what even the bigger companies are doing. Talking of competition, the first rule is never be afraid of the competition. If you start being afraid, hesitant about uh, the competition, you will never succeed in the business. And uh, uh, talking about co competition and succeeding, uh, as we, uh, as Mr. Ovia said, first of all, we have invested in technology, which has helped us a lot in terms of uh, cost control. Our uh, operative costs are the lowest, operating costs per ton of cement. Our energy costs, especially the power cost, is one of the lowest in the world. Our fuel consumption cost is low. So we have been able to set a different benchmark. We don't benchmark ourselves against our competitors. We go and set our own benchmarks, which should be far better than our competition. Today, as you talked about our competition in Nigeria, for example, they've been there for more than five decades. And their EBITDA levels have been ranging between 20 to 30%. We are operating the same environment, getting the same raw material, and two of our factories are even just having a common border. All co costs are common, whether it is gas well, yeah, or labor. Our EBITDA is about two and, and a half that times that higher than that. Investment in technology. Investment in technology and being highly cost focused. Right. Then uh, another one is the technology has helped us primarily in terms of quality. 
Because, as you see, we have been massively expanding capacity. We started from zero less than a decade back, and today we are already 20 million tons, having a 60% of the market share. And in the next three months, I'm putting up another 9 million tons coming into commissioning. Right. So if all these massive capacities, if you should be able to sell in the market, your quality should be the best. So a customer going into the market will first choose your quality, and only if it is not available, he has to go to the next brand. Right. So the technology helps us a lot in ensuring that the best possible product is available in the market. Right. I don't hear your thoughts about dealing with the competition. I mean, he just talked about some of the aspirations for the future. Many people would suggest that perhaps you should, you should be very comfortable where you are, but you're looking to, to move higher. So I think I want to hear from you about some of the strategic moves you have made. Banking is a bit different from, from some other businesses. Indeed, if you look at even banks in a place like the US, think 10, 15 years ago, the names you heard, banks are always consolidating, merging, and so on. So you get a bank like Manufacturers and Nova Chemical Bank, they've all gone. Yeah. So now, for, I'm not saying that therefore Nigeria had to go that way, but there was a, some dynamic forces at work that make it it make you have to decide in banking whether do you want to keep on going it alone or do you want to merge with the bigger institution and in, in effect do you want to always grow all by yourself or, you know as an entity organic growth and for banking you can argue that look the arguments are a lot more a bit different from from manufacturing in the sense that if you wanted to be very quickly become a pan-african player your, your, your best bet is probably to find a partner that, that fits. But I, please, I emphasize the partner that fits. Right. The worst thing you can do is to go into bed with the wrong guy right. in any business. Right. You know, so if you're able to find an institution that you have a shared vision, like we found, you looked at the top management, you could, you could, you could, um, could do business with them, then it was, it, was, it, was, it was like good fortune and you went for it. Right. But to be very honest with you, if you didn't find that perfect fit, we would have stayed alone and could go on doing our business well, and growing as best we could. Let, let's talk to someone who decided to, decided to stay alone, Zenith Bank, of course. You decided to grow organically and amazingly, you still remain uh, one of the largest banks in this country. Talk to us about that decision because it came at a time when everyone was merging because of the regulatory pressure. So your thoughts about what it takes to take that decision that you are not going to go that route, you're going to keep the culture and just try and grow it organically. Yes, our culture is a little bit different from the culture of other banks. We are very, very protective of our poor culture. We are very protective of our brand. And if you are not too certain of which bank to merge with or in terms of what you do in those banks, I mean, they may be doing great things, but you just don't know. So you are better off staying alone, growing organically, than to get to bed with a strange fellow that you don't really know well enough. That was the compelling reason for us. Continue what you're doing, run your own race. You might get to the same des destination, but in different ways. Some may get there bruised up, some may get there in one piece. So we decide to do it alone. And we've done so, so far. And you could see the results are there. And we don't need to start drumming home or advertising what the results are. Anyone could go and check the books and the records. Top 1,000 banks in the world for the very first time. A few Nigerian banks are top 1,000 banks in the world as published by the Bankers Magazine. They've done this over uh, 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 dozens of years ago, not, yeah. not because of any particular situation. And we all ranked there. And some of the institutions may have one or two or three um, other institutions that match to them. But we remain solo, we remain organic, just because of our culture, because of our brand. We continue to always say we know our culture well, we know our people well. There are certain businesses we would rather not do. There are some we'll be very happy to do. We don't necessarily need to be everything to every customer. There are some customer you have some special privileges with to serve, and some you would rather run and won't touch them with a 10 foot pole. Jay, as we round up um, very quickly, if you can, um, G is such a huge business, it's been around for well over a century. Talk to us and final word on what it takes to build to last. It's part of what I said earlier, which is focus on your portfolio of companies or, or technologies or whatever you do and make sure that you're always investing. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that we've done is invest in people. We spend a billion dollars a year in training costs globally. And this includes training new, new trainees, apprenticeships, et cetera, all the way to where we have something for high executives to go in and do leadership 
uh, four days of leadership uh, uh, work. And so I think that's a cr absolutely critical. And then there's a, a big process around looking at people and how they develop. And we have something that we do every year for every exempt employee where everybody fills out their performance, they get, they get graded on that performance, and then they get to, you know, we have a discussion about next steps. And I think that, and then that gets reviewed all the way up. So I think right. those are two of the key things is people is number one, and then two is continued investment in technology. And that concludes our look at the key principles behind building a winning business in Africa. The continent may be a challenging place to set up a business, but as our panelists have clearly shown, by applying the right principles and ethics, it can be done. I'm Wally Famriwa, and thank you for watching.